Hello everyone, my name is Michael Lawrence and uh, I'm the chair of the CGSO. It's uh, really a great pleasure for me to be able to just introduce our annual report to you, to welcome you especially, but before I do any of that, please let me just talk a little bit about why this is such a special organization. Um, we, we exist because of the legal architecture and regulatory architecture of the Consumer Protection Act. And that's really important. It's important to us. It's important to the members we have who support us financially by virtue of paying a membership fee, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and we exist because Parliament has decided that the consumer is an important part of the way in which our economy can grow and will grow successfully in, into the future. So what do we do? We really do some important things. We, as I said, the legal architecture is important to us. We participate in its construct. We are analyzing it constantly um, with the DTIC, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Um, some really great people there we're working with, um, including the minister. And our, our job really is to make sure that it, it, it works very well so that at the time consumers have issues, they can actually get those effectively and efficiently resolved. I uh, used to be a teacher once upon a time, and I'm very proud of the fact that part of what we do is in fact to educate, to educate our members, the providers of goods and services, to educate consumers as best we can, whenever we can. Um, our team, um, we have a great ombud in Makauta and a wonderful CEO in Queen and a whole bunch of other people that, that communicate on, on the telephone and, and are just available any time almost that you, you need to reach out to them. Um, but our team is, has a passion for telling everyone about what we do, why we do it, and making all of those opportunities that you have, that consumers have, in engaging with us just work so much better. So that's incredibly exciting for us. We're looking forward to the fact that in our planning phase, as we are right now, as an organization under Queen's great leadership, as our CEO, we're looking forward to the fact that we are getting better. We are going to be able to respond more intelligently. We're going to be able to engage with the, the needs even of the other ombuds that are all over, all, all, all over the, the, the the way in which the, the architecture has worked. We're very excited about the changes that are happening in the financial services sector and their ombuds. Um, but we have a, an important role to play in the respect of, of that planning as well. And we, and we think that's brilliant. What do I want to do as chair of the board? I want to, again, just welcome you to the, the, the launch of our annual report. Um, I want to tell you that we work with an amazingly great staff team here, again under the, the, the leadership and mentorship of Queen and, and, and Mahauta. Um, I want to say thank you to our staff who work under very difficult conditions through COVID, very changing conditions as we become hybrid and are now just finding new ways of making and responding better to consumers as they look to get the best out of the way in which they procure goods and services. I want to say thank you to the board. Um, really a great team who take great care of their governance and fiduciary responsibilities. Um, it's, been, it's been a team that is hardworking and that really looks to give the best leadership, governance leadership possible to the organization. And I just want to just thank them from the bottom of my heart. Very special thanks, um, and I, forgive me, I always work on first names, but that's my, my nature, um, to Cliff. Cliff was an amazing part of, of our board from inception, um, has given us great wisdom over the years and stepped down as a board member in February. Um, we also had Debbie from Cape Town, who was just a great wisdom to us over, over many, many years and gave us great a great understanding of what we needed to be doing, especially in the respect of our audit and the risk responsibilities. And then finally, I want to thank you. Those of you who are participating in this, whether you're a consumer or a provider of goods and services, you are part of what makes our country work. The fact that you're here with us in this experience 
is because you want the way in which ombud structures work to be better, and we take on that challenge. The fact that you may be here as a consumer and just making sure that you can hold us to account and that you can see that we do the best that we can do, I think that's fantastic. Please look at what we have to say, listen to what we have to say, challenge us on the, on the goals that we set for ourselves, hold us to account, and let us be even more and even better into, into the future times. Thank you for participating, thank you for sharing, thank you for ti your time in, 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 in being with us today, and I will hand over to the team to just walk you through why it is that we do really great things for consumers and service and goods providers. Thank you. My name is Queen Munyai. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Consumer Goods and Services Ombud. And thank you, Michael, for the introduction and to launch this annual report. Before I go into the gist of what we've been doing in the year, I'll start off by just giving you a quick word on what we do. We are an impartial independent dispute resolution scheme, which was established in terms of Section 82, subsection 6 of the Consumer Protection Act. Our mandate is to mediate disputes between consumers and suppliers. And we are not for consumer nor for supplier. So our role in terms of consumers is to educate them of their, their rights and redress in case any of the industry players breaches the CPA or the code. And in terms of suppliers, we are there to educate and also guide them in, in terms of uh, the application of the CPA. We are established as a non-profit organization and we are funded by participant fees. Our services are free to consumers and to suppliers, obviously, it's a matter of participation fees for all those that have signed up. Any businesses or small businesses with a turnover of less than two million are also in terms of the code described as consumers. Therefore, they do benefit from our services. We are answerable to the National Consumer Commission, to the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, and to our board of directors. I have given a little bit of what we do. Now, unto what we do not do. The first thing is that we do not have powers to make binding rulings. What does that mean? It means that we do not have enforcement powers. The NCC, which is the National Consumer Commission, is the one that has enforcement powers. Instead, what we do, we review consumer complaints and make recommendations based on the CPA or the common law or just fair business or com common sense. So suppliers and consumers, they do not have to accept or they are not obliged to accept our recommendations. In the event that a supplier refuses to cooperate with our office, consumers are free to pursue the matter further with the National Consumer Commission or through the courts. We also do not or cannot resolve all consumer complaints, only those that are involving consumer goods and services sector. However, consumers don't always know that. They phone us or phone any other ombud inquiring about anything but anything at all that they want to complain about. But what we do as an organization, when we get such queries, we refer them to the relevant ombud. We have the Moto Industry Ombud, whose code was also promulgated by the minister. We have the Banking Ombud, we have the Credit Ombud, we have the Short-Term Insurance Ombud. So likewise, if we get any queries relating to those Ombud offices, we direct them accordingly. These out-of-jurisdiction complaints are referred to relevant alternative dispute bodies. If you buy any goods from an individual, they are not covered by the CPA. Or if you go on Facebook, uh, Facebook Classified, 
That is one person to another. They are not covered by the CPA. CPA covers consumer complaints which are emanating from goods that are sold from businesses to consumers. We are going to now zoom into the year under review, the year 2022. Our financial period starts from March to February. So this report that we are launching today is covering 1 March 2021 to February 2022. Our highlights for the year under review are that we have seen an increase in the participation of uh, businesses in the industry. We have seen 8.8 .8 increase in terms of businesses, not counting those that were deregistered due to the effect of COVID. We just, uh, after taking everything into consideration, we have seen an 8.8% .8 increase, which is a good one. In terms of the number of complaints, surprisingly, we have seen 18% decrease in the number of complaints. You would remember that in the previous year, we have reported an enormous increase in the number of complaints due to COVID. But in the year under review, we have seen an 18% drop of complaints from 14.4 thousand to 11.8 in the year 2022. Backlog of cases from the previous financial year were cleared during this year. We also launched a new funding model or a revised funding model which we consulted the industry in the year before. And this year under review, we were able to launch it successfully. And we believe that it was well received by the industry. I spoke in the previous year's annual report about the project, which was approved by the board, Fit for Purpose, which was looking into re-engineering our business. That was completed. In February, we looked at the final report so we are now in the implementation stage of the recommendations that came from that report. It's quite looking good and we look forward to seeing a much more improved organization which will be serving you better. Revenue in the year 2022 has increased by 10% year on year from 18.3 million to 20 million. We also introduced a late join, join us penalty at the beginning of the financial year. In fact, at the end of the previous year, 2021, we, uh, we, we put through a press release where we were encouraging businesses who were still outside the net to sign up. If they were signing up before the end of the financial year, which is February, they were not paying the, the penalty fee. So we have implemented it from 1 March 2022. And I think it was also well received because we see that more and more businesses are signing up. And this is not punitive to those that are only signing up now. However, it's to make sure that we spread the burden. And also it's a way of contribution for the new participants to the infrastructure and all the establishment that has happened over the past nine years. Expenditure of 19 million compared to 16.9 in the previous financial year due to some special projects that we did in the previous year. We also had to add some staff. As I said that uh, in the previous year, the number of complaints were quite high. So we had to add some uh, resources to make sure that we can be able to serve and be able to comply with the uh, code approved 60 business days uh, turnaround time. So we spent a little bit more compared to the prior year. However, the cash flow reserves of 20 months compared to 20, 18 months in the prior year was maintained. In the year under review, we have seen the eighth consecutive clean audit with no material consent raised, which is a good thing from us from a business point of view because we, we take seriously uh, the participation fees that we collect from our suppliers. We make sure that uh, we, we execute what we need to do. 
So taking into consideration that we started operating in 2013, which is nine, nine years later now, this year we have in fact reached the 1,000 mark in terms of our participant, which was something to celebrate in the current year under re review. The 1,048, which we close the year with, represent about 228 subsidiaries and about more than 21,000 retail outlets across South Africa. This is still a tip of an iceberg, though. So if businesses have subsidiaries, they don't have to pay an additional fee for their subsidiaries. We only pay at group level. And this represents more than 21,000 retailers across the country. I spoke earlier about participant levels, and I indicated that we have seen an 8.8 .8 increase in the number of participants. If you look at the business, the consumer goods and services industry uh, participants, we continually actively signing up new participants to the scheme. And in the current year, we have now just appointed an outside service provider to help a sign up because earlier in the year we invested in into getting the data of the extent of the industry so with the data that we have invested in we have seen the need now to bring in uh, outside participants or outside suppliers to to beef up the staff that we have who are actively signing up new participants so our fees are based on the annual turnover and membership or participation from SMMEs is free. Now I'm going to go into the statistics. You will note that as a CEO, I'm also responsible for ensuring that we have efficient uh, way of receiving and handling the complaints that come through our offices. In the year under review, we received 18,747 queries. However, of these 18,000 queries that came through, half of them were sent via email, which indicates that the world is moving towards the digital. Of the 17, 18,000 that we received, 11,834 were new complaints compared to 14,000 in the prior year, which is a clear indication that we are returning to pre-COVID levels of business. Because of the record number of complaints received in the previous financial year, we had to carry some over to the current year under review, which is why we closed 13,946. So you'll know that that number is more than the complaints that we received in the current year. So much of them came from the prior year. The pressure of catching up with the influx of COVID-related complaints also impacted on the average number of closing the case. In terms of the code, we have 60 business days to close the cases. And in the current financial year, we, we closed our uh, com complaints within an average of 63 business days, which is slightly above what is uh, prescribed by the code. On the 11,834 complaints received, 2,983 had to be referred outside to other ombuds. As I spoke about other out-of-jurisdiction processes that we have internally, reducing the number of out-of-jurisdiction cases from entering the system is another key priority. And in the year under review, we introduced some enhancements on the system on our website, which were part of the recommendations from the Fit for Papers. There we were filtering out all complaints which are not necessarily for our office due to the decision tree that we implemented on our website. Now we're going to look at what are consumers complaining about. So we saw that 45% of our total complaints related to goods. 
goods, services and agreements accounted for a total of 94% of all complaints received in the current financial year. For the first time in this office, we also received complaints relating to civil unrest in the wake of the much publicized riots in the part of KZN and Houding in July 2021. We all can remember that. This includes goods and services that were left at suppliers for repairs and were subsequently stolen during the lootings or where transport services were cancelled as a result of violence and goods were not delivered or not delivered on time. Almost all of our complaints represent customer service failures. In terms of the nature of complaints that we dealt with in the current year, these are the three top of the list. The first one is goods not being delivered on time. Supplier seems to be struggling with delivering goods or orders that were done online on time and there were no communications and those were most of the things that uh, came out of the COVID related complaints. Goods becoming defective within the first six months. In terms of the CPA, consumers have the six months automatic warranty in which if any goods were to be defective within that period, they can return the goods for either a, re a refund, a replacement, or a repair. The last one is poor service or poor customer service. That was part of the top complaints or top of the things that consumers complained about. I am now going to talk about the complaints by product or service. Part of the outcome of the Fit for Purpose mandate was to improve our data gathering capabilities. This means that continuously we refine how we capture our complaints and how, as you can see on the slide in front of you, in the year 2021 financial year, we dug deeper into our complaints previously labeled under the umbrella term of services. So we could allocate them to services per product or service or sector. The list of all products and services is quite detailed and incorporates everything from tombstone, landscaping. For this presentation, we have summarized the top 20 sectors with the most complaints over the last three years. We have put in comparison figures for the past three years for ease of reference. So if you look at the last line item, which is other, this is the cumulative total of all other categories. The full list can be found on page 13 of our annual report. Part of the data that we gathered this financial year is we want to understand where are our complaints coming from. And we noted that the vast majority of our complaints emanated from Gauteng. This was expected given that Gauteng is the commercial hub of South Africa. So this split per province and roughly the same year on year because what we have seen is that Gauteng always carries the higher percentage of complaints followed by Western Cape, then KZN. And we are putting in measures to make sure that we reach other provinces where we, we, we see that complaints are less in those areas. Could be that perhaps there are challenges in terms of reaching our office or how they communicate with the office. So we are zooming into those figures to see how best we can serve those communities. And yes, we are still getting faxes occasionally, including the walk-in customers, because some of them, they prefer to walk in. Although in the past two years, we haven't seen those, but they still now and then show up here and there. Now onto how the consumer complaints were resolved. In the previous financial year, we saw that most complaints were resolved in favor of consumers. During the period under review, we were able to facilitate positive outcome for complainants in 60% of cases, compared to 63 in the previous year. 
Of these, 34% were fully in favor of consumers and 16% were resolved directly between the supplier and the complainant within 15 business days. In terms of our supplier or our process of, con of dealing with com complaints, we give suppliers the first 15 days to resolve complaints without us interfering. So we see that 34% were fully in favor of consumers and 16% were resolved during this time of the 15 business days. Assistance was provided in 6% of cases, while the Ombud found partially in favor of 5% of cases. Between the 1st of March 2021 and the 28th of February 2022, the CGSO was able to recover an, an amount of about 11.4 million on behalf of complainants, which is a 48% increase compared to 7.7 .7 million in the prior year. This is against the claims which we received, which amounted to about 66 million in total. The disparity in the quantum is because consumers tend to include consequential damages, or including the pain and suffering in which we have to dismiss in most of the cases because only courts can adjudicate in such claims. After each complaint that is closed in our office, we send out surveys to our consumers and we ask them to rate their experience with us. And in the previous financial year, we have sent over 10,000 surveys and about 24.2% of consumers did respond to our request. And this is what we emphasize that we request our consumers to, do, to respond because this is how we improve our dealings with them. Typically, consumer surveys get a response rate of about between 5 to 30 percent, which then puts us in the highest slide or the highest scale of our response rate. Although we continue to encourage them that if they respond, then it helps us to get feedback and improve on our services. While 92 percent of resp respondents agreed that they had been treated with respect, all other surveys were rated below 80%, with the lowest rating being 62% pertaining to the outcome of the, pro of the whole process. Now, you will note that this one includes those that are not happy with the outcomes. It will reflect on how they respond to this particular question. But we are happy that where, the, where we have control over how we are rated or when it talks to our services, how we treated them, how we explained everything, it shows that our staff are doing very well. And at this point, I would like to say thank you to our dedicated staff for the time that they take. I know that it was not an easy time to be dealing with complaints, especially during the past two years where we were uh, under the COVID-19 pandemic. But they still continuously worked tirelessly to make sure that we, we do respond and deliver to our mandate. In terms of supplier surveys, supplier surveys were first introduced in 2020, September. Out of the 10,636 surveys that were issued, only 365 rep representing about 3.4% responded to our call for that response. We are hoping that we will better engage on this important service metric going forward, where we will encourage our suppliers to respond to that so that we continuously improve on our services. But when we look at all the the, the surveys that we received back, our target is 80%. But in all aspects, we saw that our suppliers are rating us well. And it means that although there is room for improvement, but generally they are happy with how, our, how we serve them, how we guided them, how we sent all the, the documents that help us to resolve the complaints. Thank you very much for continuously engaging with us. Now, as I look back, I know that it has not been an easy year, but I want to take this time to say thank you to the chairperson 
of the board, to our board of directors for continuously supporting us and giving us the oversight and guidance that which is much needed, especially in this time. I want to thank Aus Mahauda for the cooperation and the working relationship that we have together in order to make sure that the, our consumers get their redress and the suppliers do get the guidance that they need from this office. Thank you. Good day, my name is Mahauta Mpahlele. I'm the Ombudsman of the CGSO. I welcome you all to the launch of our annual report. You have heard from our chairperson and the CEO. My role today is just to uh, highlight some of the key trends that we have identified from the complaints and also maybe talk up a little bit about some of the policy and legislative issues that we think uh, require attention uh, based on the complaints that we have dealt with. While the volume of complaints may have dropped, what hasn't changed is the nature of those complaints. Due to COVID and the lockdown, online shopping remains the number one source of frustration amongst consumers. A quarter of all complaints received by this office in the year, in the reporting year, related to online shopping. This is in line with the previous period where 27% of all complaints pertained to internet passages, compared to only 6% prior to the outbreak of COVID. To put it in perspective, the next biggest sectors in terms of complaints were satellite and telecommunications at 17.5% followed by retail appliances 14% and furniture at 12%. However, a distinction must be made between normal complaints and instances where uh, you have rogue suppliers who are taking consumers' money with no intention to provide the goods or the services. And this is a big concern for us as they are engaged in cyber fraud and other criminal activity, which we think requires more uh, action from enforcement agencies. Currently, online shopping is governed by the Consumer Protection Act and the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act. Both these pieces of legislation go a long way towards addressing consumer concerns surrounding e-commerce. The stable regulatory framework, however, is undermined by gaps in knowledge by both consumers and suppliers and challenges with tracking and prosecuting offenders. Because what we have seen is that these rogue online suppliers that are defrauding consumers usually close down their websites and, and, and operate and open new websites. So we need to look at legislative ways in which we can stop this type of practice. In order to deal with rogue online suppliers, one of the ways that uh, things that we are doing is to help consumers avoid becoming victims of online fraud, especially during the pre-Christmas holiday season, which has been shown to be the most dangerous period to transact online in terms of the likelihood of consumers being trapped by fraudsters. As we do not have powers of sanction or enforcement, our best defense currently lies in naming and shaming repeat offenders who are most of the time not our participants. When we become aware of clusters of complaints around sectors or specific e-commerce suppliers who accepted payment from consumers with no clear intention to supply the goods or services, we issue alerts, harnessing the power of traditional and social media to warn consumers against these entities. This is only done once complaints have been thoroughly investigated and we are satisfied that there is evidence of fraud or unlawful activity based on complaints received, consumers are most likely to be scammed when shopping for clothing, electronics, and hair extensions, especially on social media platforms like Facebook and uh, uh, Instagram. In the period under review, four alerts were issued against Mr. Shopper, 
Vegan Kind Boutique, Anna 11 brand, and Lippies Online. We also issued an alert for Sassy Hills. In the course of the financial year, these four entities racked up 535 complaints between themselves. As the CGSO, we are required to improve the standard of conduct in the industry, and we are also required to create awareness amongst our participants with regards to compliance with the Consumer Protection Act and general customer care. And because we have identified online shopping as an issue that requires attention, we also issued guidelines uh, to suppliers to make them aware of what the legal requirements are when they are transacting with consumers online. But we do also want to bring to the attention of policymakers and legislators that while we have the Consumer Protection Act and the ECT Act protecting consumers, we think that more needs to be done, especially with regards to dealing with rogue suppliers who clearly are there to defraud consumers. Because while we have online complaints that relate to our participants, these are dealt with properly and consumers have been able to uh, be, have been refunded where there has been issues. But with regards to these rogue uh, online suppliers, we think that needs, more needs to be done to make sure that it doesn't happen. Uh, we thank you, our stakeholders, for the support that you have given to the CGSO, the collaboration, and I want to mention the National Consumer Commission, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, as well as our staff who have been working very hard to ensure that all the complaints that we receive are dealt with. And of course, our participants who are responsible suppliers, who are there, who understand customer care and know that complaints are good for them because they also give them feedback. And we thank you for making sure that you comply with the, our code of conduct. Thank you.